Hello and welcome to GD Life at Parts. Today we will look at important concepts that you need to know for the GD Science test. This is part four. Um, yeah, we are looking at a couple of topics today in uh, summary. If you want to know more about these topics uh, in more detail, um, we have our free GD Science course on our YouTube channel. So check out the respective lessons on uh, the topics uh, if you want to know more. So yeah, here a condensed uh, version about the following topics. We will look at population, community and ecosystem, the three definitions of these uh, three terms because we will need them for the rest of this presentation about ecosystem interactions, food webs and food chains and the energy flow through ecosystems. So first of all, a couple of definitions. What is a population? A population in uh, biology is a group of interbreeding organisms of the same species living and interacting in the same area at the same time. Um, a community um, includes all the populations of different species in an ecosystem in a specific area and an ecosystem is a yeah, ecological or biological unit containing the community of organisms and their non-living environment uh, and the interactions they have together. So that includes the interactions between organisms of the same species, the interactions between organisms of different species and the interactions of organisms with their environment, like breathing air, drinking water and things like that. So the non-living part of the environment. That is an ecosystem. The size of an ecosystem is uh, not uh, necessarily defined. An ecosystem can have any, any size. It really depends on uh, the person who studies the, uh, the, the ecosystem. The ecosystem can be a huge forest. Uh, an ecosystem could as well be just a patch uh, on your skin if you're interested in the bacterial or microbial micro biobial environment and organisms that live on that patch of your skin and how they interact with each other and their environment. So sizes of an ecosystem are not are defined by the scientist who investigates the interactions. Okay, let's have a look at some ecosystem interactions, interactions that we find in ecosystems. Um, the first form of interaction is the symbiosis, which is a form of interaction between different organisms uh, of different species. And symbiosis is usually a very close interaction between these uh, two organisms of different species that usually evolves over uh, yeah, a very, very, very long period of time where these organisms either become yeah, dependent on each other in very extreme cases. Um, there are three forms of symbiosis that we should know about. The first form is mutualism. In a mutualistic relationship, both organisms benefit from the interaction. Some examples would be uh, yeah, general several different species of bees and uh, flowers, where the bee um, receives nectar and pollen, which is food and energy for the bees, and the flower uh, yeah, are able to transfer their pollen from one flower to another flower so the bee helps with the sexual reproduction process there. The clownfish and anemones. Clownfish, clownfishes live inside anemones and um, the clownfish gains protection from that. Anemones are uh, poisonous to the touch so other uh, fishes, predators of clownfishes will avoid the anemones. Clownfishes are not harmed by the anemone. They have a special coating on their skin which uh, does not trigger the uh, poison capsules that the anemones have in their skin basically. And the clownfish uh, increases the water flow through the anemone which uh, provides it with more food and uh, yeah, in general, the clownfish keeps the animal clean and helps it to get more food. 
um, corals and zooxatelli. This is probably one of the most evolved symbiosis here, which has evolved over millions of years. Um, it's a very, very, very close symbiosis where both parts uh, are almost are not able to survive without another. So the coral is a living uh, is, is, is an animal uh, that usually is transparent. It's related to the jellyfish, but we know that corals have color, all different kinds of color. So corals get their color from their symbiont, which is an algae, a unicellular algae, which are called zooxantelli, that live inside the tissue of corals. And the zooxantelli uh, are protected by the coral, where the zooxantelli, uh, they do photosynthesis um, and they provide food in the form of glucose to the coral. So very close mutualistic symbiosis. Um, commensalism, another example of symbiosis, is where one organism benefits from the interaction where the other organism is neither harmed nor uh, gains a positive effect from the interaction. It's a neutral form, basically. It's not affected. Um, some examples would be the water buffalo and the white egret. Uh, water buffaloes um, they yeah, stir up the earth and the mud and uh, the white egret, which is a white bird with a long beak, um, usually follows the water, the water buffaloes around and it helps the white egret to gain food because the water buffaloes, yeah, they stir up the mud, the earth, which brings uh, worms and other smaller organisms uh, to the surface, which the white, white egret then can feed on. The water buffalo is not really affected by that. The white egret has a positive effect that has it easier to find food. Um, another example would be epiphytes growing on trees. Epiphytes are any yeah, kind of plants that grow on other things. Many epiphytes grow on huge trees. Um, in jungles, some big trees yeah, have hundreds of epiphytes growing on them. Uh, the epiphytes benefit from being further up in the canopy, gaining more access to sunlight, whereas the tree itself is not affected by the epiphytes growing on them. There are some epiphytes which are parasitic, however, which brings us to the next form, parasitism. Um, this is where one organism, the parasite, benefits from the interaction, whereas the other organism, the host, is harmed by the interaction. We have ectoparasites, Oh, and I mixed that up here. We have to change that. Uh, ectoparasites are parasites that live on the outside of the host. For example, mosquitoes, fleas, or ticks, or lice, uh, or some epiphytes that live on trees. Uh, their roots might uh, break through the bark and access the sap of the trees, extracting some of the sap, which gives the tree a negative effect. Um, so some epiphytes are parasitic. And then there are endoparasites. Endoparasites are parasites that live inside the host. Tapeworms, nematodes that live in the gut of the host animal. Again, if you take notes or something, swap the two terms. Ectoparasites are the ones that live on the outside. Endoparasites are the ones that live inside the host. So these are the three forms of close so relationships between organisms, symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Another form of interaction in ecosystems that is very important are predator and prey relationships, and especially related to the population sizes of the two. The predator relay and predator and prey relationship is an interaction between two organisms of yeah, unlike or different species in which one of them acts as a predator that captures and feeds on the other organism, which is the prey. So a predator is an organism that eats another organism and the prey is the organism which is eaten by the predator. Um, yeah, here we see a model interaction and the population sizes of two different species, predator and prey. Hare and lynx. Hare are rabbits, basically. Lynx is a big wild cat. Um, and we can see a cyclical pattern here of predator and prey abundance or population size. Um, the 
prey usually has a larger population size than the predator. Predators usually are smaller in numbers than the prey population. In general, this has to do with energy flow, which we will learn about later. And um, what we would think of immediately, which makes sense, is that uh, predators affect the population size of the prey. For sure, predators eat prey, so when there are a lot of predators, then the prey population decreases. But if we think a bit further, the other way uh, is, around is true as well, that the prey population size has an effect on the predator population size. That is, if the prey population size is small, um, there is very little abundant food for the predators, which can lead to the starvation of some of the predators, which causes a decrease in the population. And yeah, these two populations are usually very closely interlinked with each other. And we can see that in the graph here, we can see that when the prey population is high, like this point here, or this point here, this point here, this point here, uh, this causes the predator population to increase as well, which we just said makes sense. Now there's a lot of food available for the predator, um, which allows the population of the predator to grow. At some point, um, the population of prey will stop growing because there are now a lot of predators around. So the, 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 the yeah, predation pressure is very, very high. A lot of prey organisms get caught and die, which causes the collapse of the prey population. The prey population decreases rapidly over a short period of time. And this causes then a you know, scarcity of food in the predator population, which usually follows that decrease and collapses a couple of years or population cycles uh, following the prey population. If there are few predators around, that means uh, there is less predation pressure on the prey. The prey population can uh, recover increases in size again and the cycle repeats the predator population rises again and yeah this is a very very typical cycle you should know about you should have heard of uh, which will definitely be beneficial for you to know about in the GD science exam for sure there might be nothing about it coming up but um, it is a very important concept in ecology Okay, let's have a look at food chains and food webs. So what are food chains and food webs? They're very similar um, and one is the basis of the other. So a food chain is a hierarchical series of organisms, each dependent on the next as a source of food. It shows the transfer of energy from one organism to the next, beginning with a producer. Food chains uh, are not depicting reality because very seldomly uh, there is an organism that has just one food source. So usually uh, organisms have several different food sources and this is what a food web represents. The food web is a network of all the interconnected food chains in an ecosystem. So a food web yeah, represents what really is going on in an ecosystem, food chains. Uh, basically pick out one way that energy flows through an ecosystem, which can be interesting uh, when a biologist studies the uh, yeah, flow of energy through an ecosystem. The different members of a food chain are the producers, which always are at the base of the food chain of food web, um, which is able to make its own organic nutrients, usually using the energy from sunlight through photosynthesis. Then we have consumers, um, a consumer is an organism that gets its energy from feeding on another organism and consumers can either be herbivores or carnivores or omnivores, which I forgot to list here. Herbivores uh, are animals that get their energy by eating plants. Carnivores are animals that get their energy by eating other animals. Omnivores do both, eat plants and or animals. And decomposers are organisms that get their energy from a dead or waste organic material, breaking them down, decomposing these waste organic materials. 
Here two examples, one a food chain and the other a food web. We can see the food chain only shows one way of energy flow from the producer, the plant, to the first consumer, the primary consumer, to the secondary consumer, the tertiary consumer, and the quaternary consumer at the end, the owl. And on the right side, we see a food web. We can see here included are the decomposers as well and some kind of nutrient cycles and energy input. Uh, every, as we said, this is a, a aquatic, partially aquatic food chain starts in the water. This is why we start with phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is plant plankton, uh, which is the basis of aquatic food chains. So as well, a producer here. Um, phytoplankton is eaten by zooplankton, uh, which are tiny animals. And zooplankton is then the food of several different animals in the food web like salmon, cephalopods, octopus, um, and yeah, other organisms. And we can see we rise to the top of this food chain, which is the fox, the apex predator here. Um, we can see as well that actually all organisms should have an arrow going to the decomposers. All organisms eventually uh, yeah, produce waste, organic waste material, and eventually die without being eaten by another uh, organism. And if they die without being food for the next trophic level, they will be decomposed by decomposers, which recycle the nutrients. Okay, and energy flow. So one thing about energy flow uh, that is really important to understand is that energy enters the ecosystem or our biosphere from the outside in the form of light energy from our sun and it then stays in the biosphere and the ecosystems for some time in the different organisms it's absorbed by producers usually via by photosynthesis and bound into organic compounds that contain energy like glucose and eventually um, these organic energy molecules are cycled through uh, different organisms and on every trophic level, on every feeding level, on every in every organism that makes use of these energy energetic compounds uh, by cellular respiration and cellular respiration eventually produces a lot of heat as well or whatever other action the energy is used for, for movement or whatever this all produces heat energy and heat energy is basically the most uh, the form of energy which is more or less useless and it eventually radiates away from Earth. So the energy leaves our biosphere again. So we have a flow of energy, energy entering our biosphere from the outside. It flows from one level to the next through an ecosystem and at every step, every uh, station, every level in the food chain of food web, energy is lost to the surrounding in the form of heat which leaves the biosphere or ecosystem. Again, we have a flow of energy. In this image here, we can see the flow of energy in yellow from the sun and the red arrows uh, from the yeah, yellow from the sun um, indicates the usable energy and red indicates the lost energy in the form of heat. The green bit uh, we will talk about in the next presentation when we talk about uh, nutrient cycles and biogeochemical cycles, the cycling of matter. So energy flows through ecosystems, matter cycles through ecosystems. And this is the two things that are very important to remember. Uh, energy flow and the 10% law. The 10% law uh, is about how much energy gets from one trophic level, from one Trophic level is a feeding level or position in a food chain or food web or in a food pyramid. And as we saw before in our food chain here, uh, the plant producer would be the first trophic level, grasshopper, the second trophic level, birds, the third trophic level, and so on. Uh, here we could assign trophic levels to every line. The first trophic level, phytoplankton down here, then zooplankton, second trophic level, everything that's on this stage third trophic level, fourth and fifth trophic level. 
So the 10% law is uh, how much energy gets from one trophic level to the next trophic level. And yeah, the rule of thumb is 10% here. For sure, it's not always 10%, sometimes it's more. Uh, very often, it's actually a, loss le a lot less than 10%. So when energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next, only 10% of the energy from the organic matter is passed on. The remaining 90% of energy are mainly lost to the surrounding in the form of heat energy from respiration or uh, it is not consumed and passed on to the decomposers which break it down and in the end it's dispersed as heat energy by the decomposers as well. So we can see this here in terms of energy. We start with the producers having 30,000 joules available, 27,000 joules uh, are lost to the surrounding in the form of heat energy, which means 3,000 are passed on. I think the numbers are a bit wrong here, so we have to take off a three every a zero every time. Um, yeah, and so on. So only 10% only of energy are passed on to the next trophic level. Um, here we have a little bit more realistical depiction. Uh, we have a primary producer, which absorbs energy from uh, yeah, the available sunlight energy, which in this case is uh, 20,810 kilocalories per square meter per year, which is the gross productivity and only 7,600 joules or kilocalories per square meter per year are available to the primary consumers and the remaining 13,000 are lost in the form of heat due to respiration and plants do respiration as well. Of the amount that is available, not all is consumed by the consumers. so. 4,000 of the 7,000 go to the decomposers and only 3,300 are passed on to the primary consumers, which is in this case about 15%. Um, then of these 3,000, again, 2,000 are lost uh, due to heat from respiration to the surrounding. Only 1,100 is available to the secondary consumers, of which 700 um, are not consumed and decomposed and only 383 so here we are closer to 10 percent now it's more like 12 percent are passed on to the secondary consumers and then only 21 are passed on which is now less than 10 percent to the tertiary consumers so this uh shows that um, the 10 percent rule is not exactly 10 percent every time and it shows as well that usually at the base of our food chain or pyramid um, it's more than 10 percent that's passed on from the producers to the primary consumers and the further we go up the food pyramid or down the food chain um, it gets even less than 10 percent but the yeah 10 percent is a good rule of thumb so take home message here it's from one trophic level to the next, it's about only 10% of the available energy, which is passed on. That's it for important concepts in science part four. Um, yeah, topic today, mainly ecology and ecosystem interactions. Uh, I hope you learned something. Again, if you are interested in uh, more details about these topics, uh, check out our free GD science course. Um, if you found this presentation helpful, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. It helps us a lot to reach more people that want to prepare for their GD tests and are looking for resources. Have a great day and I see you for the next presentation.